morning, good morning, good morning. It's a nice cool morning this morning. The sun's rising right now over your shoulder. The pond's letting off a little steam. We have a little morning dew. And look at those trees, would ya? We're already starting to roll into our fall colors. And it won't be long now and the snow will fly. And as that happens, the bees are hard at work preparing their winter stores and actually producing winter bees. They've been in this cycle now for a little while knowing that winter's coming and they'll actually produce bees with more body fat so they can help make through the winter uh, producing heat and providing life <laughs> for the beehive. <clears throat> so what I like to do sometimes is come out, I'll come out with my uh, Fiskars here uh, just some shears and I'll cut down this grass in front of the entrances to the uh, beehives and um, it just does a couple things it allows them to come and go a little easier and it also allows me to visually inspect the hive uh, as I'm passing by without having a bunch of stuff uh, you know growing up in front of it one other thing uh, a lot of people like to use the weed whack, and I've done that, and I've ran the mower by here, and I've done all kinds of things to agitate them. But as we are moving into the uh, natural beekeeping now for our third year, um, we're trying to be a little more symbiotic. <laughs> if that makes sense. So I don't want to bring by a bunch of agitation. Like if I was out sunning in my yard on a lawn chair, or you know, and somebody came by with their lawnmower blowing grass and causing all the vibration and sounds while I was relaxing, then I might get upset too. So we're just uh, going around the hives today. And while I'm doing that, with this hive particularly, these two hives, I was gonna talk to you about learning bee stuff. Like what I just learned at um, a class, I went to a class with Dr. Leo, you guys have seen him many times here on the channel. And what I just learned in, in a class with him over the weekend, uh, last weekend, was just amazing. You know, all the years I've been keeping bees for eight years. So you think you've kind of, you know, got it dialed in. You think you're getting it figured out. And then you start uncovering more and more information. And so having a mentor like Dr. Leo or people that have been doing this and that are really serious about their approach, it can really move the needle on your beekeeping and the enjoyment that you have. But I'm going to tell you about that in a second. It's, uh, it is kind of interesting that when I started off on my beekeeping adventure um, about eight years ago, I didn't spend a lot of time in the books, you know, I didn't I spend a lot of time with the reading, but I spent a lot of time uh, learning from beekeepers, local beekeepers, a lot of the wrong things to do on beekeeping, right? And a lot of them don't, they don't have any idea, all right? And this is a, a, an example I'm going to share with you guys of something recently that I studied out and uh, it's just amazing to me. So a lot of people use the vertical hives, um, you know, with their beekeeping. And that's what I used at first as well, because that's the mentor that I had was taught me that. Okay? It's not a bad thing. And so that's what I went with. I had the vertical hives. They were heavy. I had the back pains. I had all the disruption of the bees. You'd come to work the bees. Everything would be excited and, you know, buzzing around. And you have to rip all the way down in there to get to the brood and all the stuff that I need to inspect. And so I just, I always knew that uh, maybe there's a better way, you know, there's a more natural way. And then that's when I started doing more research and that's when I ran across uh, now my friend, Dr. Leo, okay? So the point that I'm getting to here is, is I learned beekeeping from a mentor who learned beekeeping from a mentor. And I'm not sure of the degree of education or studying that they did. So I just took the information just like most of us do. And then we try to replicate that information and then we have failure after failure after failure. And so I was doing some studying um, and I found out 
back in a long time ago when they were writing about bees. Uh, the book came out, um, Lane's book, and he was talking about the, the hives and the construction of them, and he was explaining that beehives need to have an inner wall, insulation, and an outer wall. Okay, that's about the gist of it. On the vertical hives. Someone bought the copyrights to that book and then took that chapter out and then produced beehives with only one wall, the vertical beehives, and thin at that. So, doesn't that make you wonder? Like the information that we're using or that we're learning, you know, we have to dig deeper and go way back. That's why Stacy and I are really enjoying uh, living the pioneer life in the 21st century because a lot of the things that we do here on our homestead, we've taken way back, you know, like fermenting, for example. That's thousands of years old. Our composting toilet, thousands of years old, right? So we're, we skip all this hundred-year-old stuff, the, the Industrial Revolution stuff, and we go deeper back, okay? So I'm just encouraging you guys to keep learning, keep educating yourself, and just keep, you know, striving to for success, right? If I would just have just accepted that as the norm every year, I was doing it every year. My beehive would fail every year. I would buy more nukes and then I would put them in and then maybe I would get one year out of them and then they would die. You see the, the cycle here? The sun's really coming up now. So I'm encouraging you guys to keep educating yourself. Um, it's very, very important because what I'm learning is changing everything on my beekeeping, on the way I'm approaching it, a more hands-off, a more natural method, and the bees hopefully are gonna do better for it. And the things that I'm learning at these classes with Dr. Leo uh, have just been fascinating. And you guys are getting a lot of information from these videos that we're putting on YouTube, right? And this is a great place to get information. And But it's the same kind of a thing when you get your mentor, you have to wonder where does he learn his stuff? Like, who was his mentor, right? And just like Stacy and myself here on the homestead, we're trying to get our bodies back into a really good homeostasis. You know, we want to get back to the natural. We want to get back to less chemicals. Everything we do out here is organic, and we breathe the fresh air, and we shower in the rainwater. And all this stuff really matters on, you know, your skin is the largest organ on your body. And all the food that you guys are digesting, if it's processed and, um, you know, shelved and traveled very far, you know, all that stuff contributes to sickness so you want to eat your food as fresh as you can and so all this stuff that we're learning and applying to our life is making us better people more healthy you know everything about it so now we're getting even more conscious about our bees and our beekeeping some of the foragers are waking up a couple of them are already out one just returned now, we've been pretty dry for a while, and there's not much uh, flowering, so they'll go out pretty far now and try to get what they can. But this is so much, you know, this is much more peaceful for them. And uh, it actually is for me as well, to be honest with you. One of the nice things about having the bees out in the forest is there's not much to clean out underneath them, but it'll come with its own set of challenges as well. This beehive was a split from a natural beehive that we actually caught as a swarm with natural local bees, and then we uh, had split that hive and then made this box here. So it's called a natural split, if you will. I had some problem with uh, the ants. We had some big black 
not, I don't think they're carpenter ants, but they're pretty big black ants. Um, I cleaned out the box and then I put some diatomaceous earth down at the bottom of the box, all on the ground here, and that deteared them pretty good. And so over time it goes away. You can just see there's like just a little bit of white powder down there. Now, if you're going to do this underneath your beehives, you want to make sure that you're you know, very careful with putting it down. If you don't want to get the bees in there at all. Uh, but it is an effective deterrent. And even around your garden, if you guys are battling that around your garden. Yeah, I could just sit out here and watch them for a while, can you? It's also a good time to always check your beehives, just on the physical appearance on the outside, make sure everything's still doing, doing good. You can see here they're dragging out somebody. See him right there? That bee actually has another bee in its hands. So what they're going to be doing right now is kind of cleaning out the hive. He just dragged it off the hive and brought it over here. Hours of enjoyment with the beehives. Uh, so I went to that class last weekend with Dr. Leo and it was amazing. Uh, all the hours that I've spent with him here at our apiary and uh, he was saying some things that I was picking up on there. My ears are always listening really good. And I was like, man, all that time we spent together and I never heard that. Um, so I guess the point is, is to not only watch these videos, but if you can invest the time going to classes you know, going to Dr. Leo's class and learning hands-on with the beekeeping and asking questions, right? And getting those answers and you can really like get the real-time exchange of your question and the answer and it really makes for a better learning experience. And the Homesteaders of America conference is coming up. Actually, it's this weekend. So you guys could log into Homesteaders of America and you can get a virtual ticket. They went virtual this year. And you guys could learn about homesteading like at that thing. And then there's the Homesteading Life Conference every year in Hannibal, Missouri in August. And that's actually one that Stacy and myself host. That you guys could come there and learn. We have a great bunch of speakers and every, you know, we have hands-on stuff and workshops. And it's always a really good time. So there's all this information out here for you guys to glean from on a hands-on educational classroom setting uh, that really can help you guys learn even more about this lifestyle and you know this adventure and beekeeping for sure. So I'm gonna move on away from them and get out of their flight plan. I just wanted to show you guys another nice thing about doing this uh, little grass cleaning and stuff little walk around is just I'm checking the hives too just seeing how they're doing the temperatures are starting to drop I'm noticing if they're being busy in the daytime what temperatures are they starting to fly around at I can see they've been poking in and out of this entrance the whole time I've been here they're just guarding it and uh, you know everything looks really good here so I want to tell you guys about this class though and some of the information that I picked up As a matter of fact, you guys just check out these clips real quick. I'm going to take you guys into the classroom, into the whole day, give you some snidbits of what you can expect if you sign up for the class. And you might just hear something that you never heard before. All right? And then I'll see you guys on the other side of this, and then we'll uh, talk about this log cabin giveaway that we're doing. each other because we have people from 16 different states and you may discover that the person uh, who lives next door to you in the land far away is actually in this room too. My uncle had been keeping bees since 1972 before I was even born. So spending summers in his village around the bees and helping him was really part of my upbringing in uh, a bee colony. Because with the tomato I need to plant the seed and fertilize the soil and water it if it's too dry and protect it from all kinds of wildlife. You will see my garden space today, it looks like a correctional facility. <laughs> <laughs> the 
impressive feet and in fencing, but there are things that can go under or over, then you put electric around it, but still, you know, squirrels can be four feet in the air, and on and on and on. With bees, it's different. You put them in the box, as the old books say, uh, you know, it didn't require much effort even in the age when there were no tractors or electricity to help farmers in their farming chores. So if you were on an island with no tractors, electricity, you are in 1835, big family to feed, how many hives could you have? Without them requiring too much of your time that you need for planting your wheat and building your log cabin from scratch. Would you have five hives? Not even five, yeah, because today five is so much work. Well, here is the original quote from 1835 book. Peasant families commonly have 1,000 beehives, tending which required little effort, so then the adults could there take care of their other things and just turn up there once a year to collect some honey. Again, Tom Seeley determined by experiments, by placing boxes at different heights, which ones were the ones that the bees actually moved into the most. And he discovered that 10 to 15 uh, feet of the ground is the minimum uh, height that they prefer. So why would they give preference to being 10 feet to the, in the air compared to say 3 feet or 2 feet? Predators. Predators. And this is the most important thing. Uh, and not just bears, because there are some predators that are more rashes as far as honey bees are concerned, like skunks. Around here, skunk would be the most uh, as far as uh, pr predator for the bees because they come and they eat bees at night. If the entrance is close to the ground, they come and they scratch, and the bees have the instinct. If they hear that outside their home at night, the guard bees come out to investigate, and the skunks just hit them, roll them, and eat them, and scratch again. <laughs> and more bees come out. It becomes almost like a dispensing machine. <laughs> you scratch and protein appears. So skunks can sit there for nights, and in, in three nights they can eat all of the bees in the colony just by scratching and eating, scratching and eating. This is the sumac, which is my primary source of nectar. The honey you can produce from sumacs is so abundant and so valuable that uh, you can probably make more on one acre of land here in the Ozarks by putting your beehives than uh, destroying the trees and putting cattle on. Yeah. The swamp trap on this tree, and up to this year I keep uh, putting swamp traps there. And uh, this one is already the second swamp trap of the year because I already got one swarm from this tree. And I'm pretty sure that it's not from my hives because they're too close for the swarm to move into this box. Uh, so you but, can actually put a swarm trap kind of close to where your hives are. You could, but you are not likely to catch swarm from your hives. For this reason, bees have stayed a semi-wild creature. They can go from our hives into the woods and survive there. Unlike domesticated animals, if we let our cows and pigs go into the woods, they won't be able to survive. So, I don't want bees to be domesticated and saving them from disease by using antibiotics and medicine is a form of domestication because you are propping up the animals or insects uh, or plants that cannot do it on their own but then it means the next generation will be again dependent on you providing all this care and looking at what the bees can accomplish without any intervention is really eye-opening in the old days they were saying if you need more honey have more beehives right Today's approach, if you want more honey, do more management and do this and feed them sugar. But all these manipulations are disruptive, expensive, they take a toll on your time, on the bee health. And in the end, yes, you can increase the production, but you increase this honey production at the expense of all these other things and even at the expense of losing the vitality and the health of the honeybee colonies in the first place. And she says, receiving stings on a daily basis is what keeps her going despite the chronic Lyme disease. On and on and on. Okay, so this is about protective gear. I do have a smoker and actually giving bees some smoker uh, is not as disturbing to them as to open it without a smoke if, if they become agitated. <coughs> if like, you know, if, if your house is on fire and somebody's coming in to steal 
something you stop paying attention to the robbers because you have some bigger issues to worry about mm -hmm. this is how this works it actually switches their attention from you to what they need to pay special attention to so i have the hive tools this is just for prying the uh, frames apart breaking the propolis seal and i have this uh, magnet that i carry here i call it where is my hive tool mm -hmm. You know, uh, you keep losing so many of them in the grass that having something that is a strong magnet and that you can just uh, put here and you always know where your um, hive tool is. Okay, so installing it is simple. Uh, you know, you may be intimidated by the idea of using uh, electricity to do that, but this direct 12 volt current is really safe and uh, it's the quickest, it's the cleanest. There are also methods when you put it on the table and you use a special roller to push the wires into the wax, it leaves grooves and the comb will not be as straight as just using electricity here. So, you need to elevate the bottom of the frame a little bit so that the gravity pushes the uh, sheet of beeswax foundation towards the top bar. And then you plug in this uh, laptop adapter. And uh, connect the white wire and the black wire to the ends of well, these if you put them together, you wire. Yeah, there was a spark. Pay attention to that. Don't do that. <laughs> so you put it like that, and the electricity starts running through these wires, and you just watch it until it starts showing on this side. They just melt. But it's melting into the wax. So when you see that there are wires showing on this side, pay attention because if you leave it on too long. It will actually cut through it like a cheese string, string through cheese and fall through. So when you see that some wires like stitches appear on this side, uh, you release the, uh, uh, the electric current, the wires, and let it cool for a few seconds. And here is the frame with the wires that melted uh, into the frame, ready to go. So it took maybe 15 seconds, so you can Prime lots and lots of frame with beeswax, sir, in this way. So that was just some of the information I was able to collect for you guys while I was at the conference. Because I myself was there trying to learn and I was talking with you guys, answering your questions. Dr. Leo was answering your questions. So I wanted to put this little video together to encourage you guys to show up at these events, right? There's these some of you guys don't even know maybe that these things are going on uh, but there are people that are really good at what they do that have a passion for teaching and they want to help you guys learn okay and they're very reasonable with their cost dr. Leo has free plans on his website for the boxes if you want to build them free plans for the swarm catchers if you want to catch the swarm stop buying bees you can catch local bee swarms you guys come to this channel, me and Stacy talk about eating close to your neighborhood, being close to your neighborhood. I buy these clothes and have them made because I want to spend my money in my neighborhood, right? It's just like the bees. Keep them local. Get local bees. Don't get bees from Florida and bring them up to Minnesota. They're not going to do well for you. Catch a local swarm that's adapted for year after year after year. All that stuff makes so much sense now, guys. I'm just telling you, I was so, I didn't even really, it, it just didn't register. And I don't know, it was just like I had that aha moment. And keeping bees naturally is a win for me, the bees, and the homestead. So hopefully you guys really enjoyed the little bit of clips and stuff that I was able to secure for you guys um, uh, for the, for to show you what you could learn if you attended one of these conferences in, in, in person, okay? So the link is down below. Like I said, there's only 17 seats left. It's the end of October. You guys are gonna be harvesting honey. I think there's a build a swarm catch workshop or something. You guys have to check the link and then you have to uh, see what's going on. But I know he's gonna be harvesting honey and he goes through all the good stuff about basic natural beekeeping, right? And if you're able to attend, you don't want to miss it. And it can also be on your radar for next year. You can start seeing the classes. And he's also a speaker at the Homesteading Life Conference in Hannibal, Missouri. So you can kind of follow it out, see where he's at, get more education, be a better beekeeper, and keep bees with a smile. 
all right? And about that log cabin giveaway, we're not giving away our log cabin, but we are giving away a two bedroom, one bath log cabin as soon as we hit a million subscribers, 100 million views by the end of this year. So you guys gotta get rocking, you gotta share these videos, hit the subscribe button, make sure you hit the bell for notifications. You probably heard all this stuff before. Uh, but we're doing this for you guys. We're giving back, saying thank you for blessing us by showing up all the time, watching our videos. And it's just one way that we're giving back. And there's gonna be a lot more, so stay tuned. We're gonna be like on any, we're gonna be unlike any channel <laughs> that you've seen on YouTube around the homesteading guys. All right, see you guys on the next video.